This presentation will give you an overview of anatomy and physiology. Knowledge of anatomy and physiology is vital for your work as an emergency medical technician. Uh, your ability to recognize problems, treat them. You need to you know the, the uh, basic principles of the way the body functions from its basic core elements, from the cell, the basic unit of life. Take into this consideration that the basic component of life is the cell. Cells tend to group together with like cells, cells that are just like them, and these groups of cells form tissue. Tissue is molded into a shape that becomes functional, and that functional shape is called an organ. Organs group together with other organs doing the same function and is part of an organ system, like the gastric system, the neurologic system, the cardiac system, the respiratory system. And then these body systems group together to form the organism, the human being, the human body. So understanding of anatomy and physiology from its most basic core structure, the cell, is very, very important, not only for emergency medical technicians and emergency medicine, but all medicine as well. So we're going to be reviewing the fundamental anatomy and physiology structures and their functions. In order to understand how something works, you can better understand how to treat it when it begins to break down. And the breakdown of body systems is known as pathophysiology. So, it's important to understand a working anatomy. In addition, you need to understand the terminology for anatomy. This is very important and is part of the discussion today. First, you need to map the body. And this is known as topographic anatomy. There are landmarks that are visible, and these are known as superficial landmarks. They serve as guidelines to the structures that are lying beneath them. Because the only real organ you can see very clearly is the largest organ in the body, which is the skin. So a topographical anatomy puts the patient in what's known as the anatomical position. The anatomical position is the patient standing facing you, arms at the side, palms facing forward. The palms are the front of the hand. The back of the hand is on the other side. We then cross-section the body into imaginary planes. We have the coronal plane, which is the front and back. The transverse is top to bottom. Sagittal or lateral is left to right. So this is a graphic that illustrates all of the imaginary planes of the body. This is the important part in mapping, is setting up a topographical box structure. From this topographical box structure, we can then send directionals either going away or going towards. And that's important. Examples of this is anterior, which is the front, posterior, which is the rear. When we talk about left or right, one common misperception is that we're always talking about our left and right. It's not. It's the patient's left and right, which is a mirror image of ourselves. So if it's our left, it's the patient's right. So when you're making a, um, a documentation piece or you're giving a report, you always talk about 
right and left in the terms of the patient's right and left, not your own. For instance, if you look at this graph, this picture of a patient, when you're looking at the patient's right, it's actually going to be looked at as far as your left. The patient's left is actually your right. This is a mirror image as you're looking at the screen. So just remember, always looking on the patient's perspective. Now everything talks about going towards the center or moving away from the center. The center of the body is known as the midline. Now the midline separates right from left and things moving away from the midline are known as distal. Things moving towards the midline are known as proximal. Things moving away from the head are known as inferior, whereas things moving towards the head are known as superior, above and below. Our bodies are flexible. They're designed for movement. Our bodies are designed to actually be mobile. The reason for that is 10,000 years ago, we were living in caves. We had to go and find food. So we were mobile to feed ourselves. So the bending of joints is known as flexion. The straightening of a joint is known as extension. Adduction, moving towards the midline. Abduction, moving away. Think about the difference. When you add something, you add towards. When you abduct, you move away from. Here's an example of this in graphic form showing flexion and extension, adduction moving towards, and abduction moving away. Our bodies are designed to have equal sides, right and left. This is known as bilateral. We are same one side as well as the other. So your right arm looks a lot like your left arm right leg looks a lot like your left leg. The right side of your face is the same as the left side of your face. Down in the abdominal section there are four quadrants. The reason why we separate into four quadrants is because the abdominal portion of the body has many organs of digestion between the stomach, the spleen, the liver, the intestines and even the appendix have to be separated into quadrants. And we have the right upper quadrant, the left upper quadrant, the right lower quadrant, and the left lower quadrant. The point in the middle of the four quadrants is going to be your embolicus, your belly button. And here it is in graphic form. Once again, what you're looking at, you see the organs that lay underneath You'll know somebody who has right upper quadrant pain could have a problem with their liver, their gallbladder, whereas a patient with having left upper quadrant pain is going to have more of a GI distress or maybe a spleen issue. Where we find patients and how we, we um, move them is important too. It, it means a lot to our assessment, it means a lot to the way we treat patients, and documentation is very important. So we label different ways that patients can lay on the ground, or can lay on a stretcher or a bed. Prone, they're laying face down. Supine is, is laying face up. Now. Of the two, which is easier for patient assessment, obviously with supine you have access to the airway, you can expose the chest, you can, you can check for abdominal pain by palpating the four quadrants. It gives you a, a much better canvas to do your assessment. Prone, on the other hand, can get in the way of airway management, 
and any real treatment. So all patients should be found prone, rolled over to a supine form. Shock positions, this is also known as Trendelenburg position, is where the legs are elevated. And we do that to have gravity assist us in, in bringing some blood down from the legs where it's not necessarily needed right away to the chest and the brain. Positions that you find patients to be put on stretchers are known as Fowler positions. And we have semi-Fowler and full Fowler positions. And these vary by degrees. We call them 45 degrees as semi-Fowlers, putting the body, we're looking at there, that picture of a Fowler's, that's a semi-Fowler's position. Whereas sitting in a chair, bolt upright, or putting the stretcher all the way to the top, where the patient sits, sits almost like an L, that's a 90 degree full Fowler's position. Now we can adjust Fowler's to whatever meets the patient's needs or comfort levels. This is why we call the Fowler's position the position of comfort. And then the last position we have is the recovery position. This is something that we teach in CPR. If we're, if we're doing chest compressions on a victim and they suddenly become conscious or they start showing signs of life, we want to roll them into this recovery position. And the reason why, of course, is it, it prevents any aspiration or choking on vomit if the patient actually does that. It is also a comfortable position for some patients who are in pain, abdominal pain, to lay in. What we call this position in emergency medicine is the lateral recumbent position. The lateral recumbent position can be either right or left, depending on which arm the patient is laying on. And what you're looking at here is the patient is laying on her left arm. So the patient is left laterally recumbent. So let's review these, these different types of body systems that I mentioned. Once again, the basic unit of life is the cell. We have trillions of cells in our body. Like cells will group together to form tissue. So bone cells will stick together to form a bone, bone tissue. Tissues create, they merge together to make a shape, a usable shape for the body, and that's known as an organ. Organs will group with other like organs and make up an organ system. And then finally, these organ systems will all work together to keep an organism alive, to create the organism itself, the human body. Now what gives us our shape is our skeleton. It also, in addition to providing a shape and mobility, it protects us. It protects our vital organs. Rib cage, for example, will protect our lungs and our heart. The skull will protect our brain. Skeletal system contains, it's comprised of bones, ligaments, tendons, and cartilage. Remember that ligaments and tendons and cartilage are the areas that connect to the bone. Ligaments connect bone to bone, tendons connect muscle to bone, and cartilage serves as a cushioning agent for space between bones. So once again, ligaments connect bone to bone. You find them in, in your knee, you have your anterior cruciate ligament, your posterior cruciate ligament. They connect the femur to the tibia. Tendons will connect your bone to the muscle. They stretch off a muscle and they attach to bone. And then the cartilage is the swishy space between bones. It provides cushioning and support.
The term axial skeleton refers to the skull, spinal column, and thorax. So in it contains your central nervous system, your brain, your spinal cord. Coming off of the spinal column is the thoracic part called the ribs. The rib cage is also known as the thorax. The skull is made up of a total of 18 bones. You have four that comprise your cranium and then 14 that comprise your face. And you have your mandible, which is your jaw bone. And you can see that these different bones are given names. The cranial bones are known as the parietal, the frontal, the temporal, and the occipital. The parietals are on the side, the frontal is in the front, the temporal come off of the frontal, this is where your temples are located, and the occipital is in the back. Moving on to the facial bones, you have the nasal bones, the zygomatic bones, or the cheekbones, the maxilla, the mandible. This gives shape and structure to your face and your airway, your nasal pharyngeal airway, your oral pharyngeal airway. Spinal cord is comprised of 33 bones. These irregular bones are known as vertebrae. The spine is divided into five distinct sections of these vertebrae. From the skull down to the tailbone, we start with the cervical. And you can see you have seven cervical vertebrae. We call them C1 to C7. The thoracic, we have 12 thoracic vertebrae, known as T1 to T12. The lumbar, we have five. They're known as L1 to L5. The sacrum, we have five. This is known as S1 to S5. And then the coccyx are four fused vertebrae. The coccyx when you're describing it, it only is that single bone. It's not separated into different bones like cervical, thoracic, lumbar, and sacrum are. So once again, cervical is five, thoracic has 12. I'm sorry, cervical is seven, thoracic have 12. Lumbar have five, sacrum have five, and coccyx is four fused bones. Now coming off the thoracic vertebrae, the 12 thoracic vertebrae, are bony structures known as ribs. And these ribs encompass around. They come around to the front or the anterior portion of the body and they connect to the sternum. And this forms the thorax and it looks like a cage, hence the term rib cage. And inside this cage are your heart, your lungs, your esophagus, and your great vessels. Now if you look at the graphic and you see the bluish bones, these bones are blue because they're highlighted to show you that these are known as the costal ribs. Where the blue starts, are ligaments. And what this does is it gives this rib cage flexibility. If you need to take a deep breath, it'll expand. When you have a product when you have a cough for a few days, this area will become inflamed. And this can lead to chest pain which gets worse on inspiration. Also, when you're doing chest compressions during CPR, and you feel a rib crack, what's happening is you're popping the cartilage 
that is between the space of these ribs. So more than likely you're not fracturing the bone as much as popping some cartilage. The cartilage can be replaced. But that's, having this in place allows you to take deep breaths and to be able to have flexibility. So that's the axial skeleton. Now hanging off of the axial skeleton is known as the appendicular skeleton. And this is the arms, legs, and pelvis. So it includes the upper and lower extremities as, long as, as well as the pelvic girdle and the hip. Review the upper extremity. The upper extremity extends from the shoulder girdle down to the fingertips. It's comprised of the arms, which is the humerus, which comes directly off and is it ends with the elbow joint. Distal to the elbow joint, moving away from the midline, distal is the forearm. The forearm ends at the wrist. Distal to the wrist hinge is the hand and then finally the fingers. So the arm bone itself is otherwise known as the humerus. The forearm is comprised of two bones known as the radius and ulna. Then the hand bones are known as the metacarpals and the fingers are the phalanges. But it all comes together at the hinge point, which is the shoulder girdle, which comprises the clavicle and the AC joint. In the rear is the scapula. So the arm itself, the humerus, coming distal from the humerus is the forearm, the radius and the ulna. Off of the radius ulna, distal to it, now we start the hand bones. And you can see the carpals, metacarpals, and then the fingers, otherwise known as the phalanges. The connection point of the lower extremities is the pelvis. This is the closed and fused bony ring, and it consists of three bones. You have the sacrum, and you have the pelvic bones. The pelvic bones are fused by the ilium, ischium, and pubis. And what the fusion of these bones does in conjunction with the coccyx bone and the end of the sacrum, it creates almost like a collecting bowl that protects the great vessels, the descending aorta and the inferior vena cava, which carry a lot of blood constantly. It protects them from the outside and allows for movement. Hanging off of the pelvis are the two lower extremities. You have your thigh, which is your leg bone. This femur, as it's called, is the longest and strongest bone in the body. It has to be. It supports the axial skeleton. It allows the axial skeleton to move about. It moves through a ball and socket joint at the top of the femur that attaches into the pelvic girdle known as the acetabulum. 
So that ball at the top of the femur attaches into the pelvic girdle to form the hip. Distal to the femur is the kneecap. The femur ends and the knee begins. The patella is your kneecap. And that is the connecting point to the lower leg. The tibia, which is the shin bone, it's anterior, meaning facing forward. And the fibula, which is more lateral. And these two bones make up the lower leg. Here's a good graphic of your lower extremity. So once again, you can see from the top the pelvis and the femoral head inserting into the acetabulum to create the hip. The greater and lesser trochanters guide the bone down, straighten it out, and allow for that movement that we have known as walking and running into the femur, the longest and strongest bone in the body. The femur ends and the connection point to the lower leg is at the patella or knee. Coming off of the patella is the lower leg, comprised of the tibia, which sits anterior, and fibula, which sits lateral. From there we have the ankle and the tarsals. The foot is comprised of the metatarsals and the phalanges are the toes. So, if you think about the hands, the hands are known as carpals and metacarpals. And the feet are comprised of tarsals and metatarsals. I just remember that because you drive a car with your hands, not your feet. Well, some of you might. But I drive a car with my hands. So the foot takes a lot of pounding over the course of a day. So it needs a lot of cushioning. The tendon, known as the Achilles tendon, connects the muscle to the bone. And you can see the medial malleolus and the talus provide that cushioning and you see the muscles and tendons and, and connective tissue that encircle these bones for protection. So I described the elbow and the knee. I described the hip and the shoulder girdle. These are examples of joints. Wherever you have two long bones coming in contact together, a joint occurs. So we can have a hinge joint where you have restriction only to one plane. And a perfect example of a hinge joint is an elbow. And you can have a ball and socket joint, which allows for rotation and bending. And there are two major ball and socket joints in your body, the hip and the shoulder. And here we are showing on the graphics the difference between the two. So the skeletal system allows for the body to have form, to have shape that's necessary for movement. It provides protection for, fra for the fragile organs, especially in the chest and the head. But in addition to this, it's also a storage place for calcium. Calcium is a necessary electrolyte for many muscular functions, heart functions, and brain functions. So always having a good supply of calcium is necessary for a healthy lifestyle. In addition, bones create blood cells, both red and white. They do that by storing 
bone marrow inside spaces located in the center of bones. Big bones like femur store and the tibia store this bone marrow and protect it. And the bone marrow produces the red blood cells and the white blood cells. You might find patients with chronic diseases or cancers like leukemia, where the body cannot create white blood cells. They will undergo a bone marrow transplant where they will receive a donor's bone marrow in an effort to now create white blood cells to battle the leukemia. So the musculoskeletal system, the muscles, the, the bones in conjunction with the muscles provide not only the structure, but good posture and movement. Now there are more than 600 muscles that are attached to the bone. These muscles are known as skeletal muscles. They are under conscious control, meaning you are able to use them whenever you see fit to do whatever function you want to do. That's what's known as voluntary usage. You choose to use skeletal muscles you can not use them or you can aggressively use them through exercise. That's all up to you and they're under your conscious or voluntary control. There are a total of three types of muscle groups. We just described the skeletal muscle. But now we have two types of involuntary muscle. These are not under your conscious control, but they serve vital function to daily living. Smooth muscle you find on your GI tract, okay, it's in your, your uh, lungs, your bronchioles, your arterioles of your cardiovascular system. They are not under conscious control. They're controlled by the subconscious part of your brain, the diagnostic center in your brain controls digestion, blood pressure, heart rate. So those are your smooth muscle. Skeletal muscle, I'm sorry, cardiac muscle is the muscle that makes up your heart. Now cardiac muscle doesn't look like smooth muscle. Cardiac muscle looks more like skeletal muscle. It works under the same premise, but it's not under your conscious control. You can't control your heartbeat. But you can control where you're walking to or how you move your arms and legs. So skeletal muscle is voluntary. Cardiac and smooth muscle are involuntary. And you can see the network. What we're looking at here is the skeletal muscle, how it gives us our form, our shape. The way muscles work is for a very simple process. They either contract or relax. Contract or relax. And that's the process of movement. They get smaller, contract, or they relax out. When they contract, the tendon pulls the bone. And that allows for movement. When they relax, the bone goes back into its normal function. That's the process. And also, it's so advanced that while one muscle group is relaxing, Another muscle group is contracting. It's, a, it's a, an extremely intricate network that's controlled by you and your brain.
Now another thing that they can do is because they're doing all this contracting and relaxing, they're, they're, they have to create energy to do this. And a byproduct of energy is heat. So this is what happens when the body is cold. It will use the muscles to generate heat and it does it through shivering through a, a rapid succession of spasming, of, of contraction and relaxation. And that resembles the shivering that I'm sure you felt and your patient, can, you can come across a patient having. That's a sign that the body temperature is dropping and the body is trying to get the temperature back up to normal. Moving on to the respiratory system. The respiratory system allows you to breathe. There is only one way that you can receive oxygen into your body, and that is through the process of respiration. The respiratory system has structures that allows not just the entry of air into the body, but also the way to get oxygen into your bloodstream. It's an intricate structure of what amounts to a large pipe that has exposure to the outside at the pharynx, the nasopharynx and the oropharynx. And from there, air travels past the epiglottis into the larynx, otherwise known as the voice box, traveling down the trachea splitting at the carina into the right and left bronchus. From there, it travels to the bronchioles and into the alveoli, pictured on the far right. The alveoli look like little sacs that are stuck together, and they're hollow. They collect the air that has been breathed in. That's the end of the travel for that air. And you can see how there's an intricate network of blood vessels known as capillaries that encircle these little balls of trapped air. And from there, this is how oxygen gets into the bloodstream. So what you're looking at, everything that's there, the, from the upper airway to the trachea, the carina, the diaphragm, base of the lung, the bronchioles, the bronchus, these are all structural parts of the respiratory system. But they serve no function in terms of getting oxygen into the bloodstream. The functional area of the respiratory system is located at the alveoli. Those small little pockets that trap air, they're the functional area because from there the oxygen molecule can make it across into the bloodstream. Everything else is just in place to make sure that the air gets to the alveoli. And this is everything we have. The upper airway is the nose, the mouth, the tongue, the jaw, the oral cavity. It's where the, the air first gets in. The upper airway has what's known as the nasopharynx, which is the nasal passage and in the oropharynx, which is the oral passage. The nasopharynx actually has a filtration device. They have hairs inside, known as cilia, and it also is a warming area. When you breathe through your nose, it becomes a little turbulent, and it actually warms the air, and it filters it out. So if you're gonna breathe optimally, it's better to breathe through your nose, then through your mouth. 
either way, both passages, nasal or oropharynx, are going to lead to the laryngopharynx, which is the opening of the trachea. Now, there are two holes in your neck. There are two pipes in your neck. One pipe is the trachea. That sits anterior towards the front. The other pipe sits posterior, and it's known as the esophagus. And of course, the esophagus is where food proceeds down and reaches the stomach. What makes sure that food doesn't go down the wrong pipe into the trachea is a flap of tissue that comes off the tongue that when you swallow pushes down over the trachea and it's known as the epiglottis. So the epiglottis prevents food and liquid from actually bypassing the esophagus and entering into the trachea. And it does it by closing up over the trachea. Now a lot of drowning victims, patients you may encounter who have drowned in fresh water, they don't drown because water enters their lungs. They drown because their body attempts to drink the water, the pool or the lake that they're in. And by drinking, the epiglottis covers over the trachea and will not open up. And they literally suffocate by having the epiglottis covering over the tracheal opening. So we're coming past the tracheal opening. And we're going down to the lower airway. So the lower airway starts at the larynx. The larynx is the dividing line between the upper and lower airway. That's very important to understand and remember. The larynx divides the upper airway from the lower airway. It is the start of the lower airway. Anterior in the, in the larynx, the voice box, is the Adam's apple in men and the thyroid cartilage in women. Coming off of below that is the cricoid cartilage and the cricoid rings. Now these tracheal rings connect the, the connective had the connective tissue its shape to make it like a, a very um, rigid tube known as the windpipe. This trachea ends at the carina and splits and divides into the right and left bronchi. The top of the bronchi coming off the carina is known as the right and left main stem bronchi. From there we travel distal down towards the alveoli and we branch into the bronchioles. Now the bronchioles are comprised of smooth muscle and they actually will regulate the flow of oxygen and air going into the alveoli. So if a patient comes across a noxious gas, they will immediately start coughing. What happens is the bronchioles will constrict to prevent this noxious air from entering any further from going past and going into the alveoli where it could enter into the bloodstream and cause damage. So the constriction and the coughing prevent that from happening. There are some genetic diseases. We call them reactive airway diseases and one type of reactive airway disease is asthma where it's a disease where anything can cause this sudden constriction of the bronchioles. Asthmatics say that they trigger their asthma through um, stress, sickness, um, food, 
certain drinks, things like that will cause a constriction. Cold weather, anything can bring on this bronchial constriction. But that is known as a reactive airway disease and categorized as different things like bronchiolitis and more commonly known as asthma. So everything is held together in place by things that are known as pulmonary ligaments. These ligaments are able to keep the lungs in the same location. They're attached to the ribs. In addition, we have arteries and veins that are entering into the lungs, dropping off carbon dioxide, picking up oxygen. And this dropping off of carbon dioxide and picking up of oxygen is known as gas exchange. And that gas exchange, once again, takes, takes place in the functional area of the lungs, known as the alveoli. Lungs, since they're expanding and relaxing, expanding and relaxing with this process of breathing, they will rub up against the rib cage, and they need to be kept moist at all times. So they are encased in a sac called the pleura, and the pleura protects them from actually rubbing up against the bone. Without the pleura, and having the lungs rub against the bone, the lungs could possibly they'd become irritated and possibly rupture. So here's the structure of the lungs. And one thing to look at is to visualize and see just how high up lungs are. And you can see the diaphragm, the muscle here at the bottom. Just look and see how high lungs are. And you can see the lobes pictured here. On the patient's right, the right side of the lungs, right, right lungs have three lobes. The left lung is comprised of two lobes. And the reason that the left lung only has two lobes is because it needs to have additional space for the heart. So the heart will sit right between the lungs, more left-sided, right here. I mentioned the diaphragm, that muscle that you saw on the bottom. Diaphragm is the primary muscle for breathing. It contracts and moves down. It relaxes and moves up. In addition, we have our other muscles for breathing. The intercostal muscles, muscles that are found between the ribs, abdominal muscles below the diaphragm in the abdomen, and then pectoral muscles, which come off of the neck and help provide strength for the shoulder. So the function of the respiratory system like I said, is to get oxygen into the body, into the circulatory system, so it can be delivered to all the cells in the body. The cells require oxygen. It also serves as a way to get rid of excess carbon dioxide. Cells waste out carbon dioxide when they use oxygen for their metabolism. So we're always creating carbon dioxide in our body. We need to get rid of that carbon dioxide. And the way we do it is by breathing out. That's the gas exchange that I mentioned earlier. So everything we're describing, the breathing in, the structures of the pharynx, the larynx, the trachea, the bronchus, the bronchioles, the alveoli, these are all structures that allow for ventilation. The ability of getting oxygen into the body is a process known as ventilation. When oxygen arrives at the cells and the cells take in the oxygen and use it to create energy, 
and waste out carbon dioxide as a byproduct of creating this energy, that's known as respiration. So these are two separate interdependent functions, ventilation and respiration. Respiration is cellular. It's how the cells get oxygen. Ventilation is how oxygen enters the body. So, just to describe cellular metabolism, oxygen enters the body into the bloodstream. It's picked up by the red blood cells. The red blood cells have a protein inside of it called hemoglobin. Hemoglobin can actually seat four oxygen molecules. Each hemoglobin protein can carry four oxygen molecules. So it sees all this oxygen up by the lungs, picks up the four oxygen molecules, and off it goes. To give an example of how many red blood cells you have in your body, one drop of blood contains 50,000 red blood cells. Capillaries that line the alveoli that make this exchange, that allow oxygen to jump on, are one red blood cell thin. So you can just imagine how intricate this system is. So this one red blood cell, as it goes by one at a time, picks up four oxygen molecules. Then it drains into the pulmonary venules and the pulmonary veins. From the pulmonary vein, it goes into the left atria of the heart, into the left ventricle, and then it gets pumped throughout the body. The next place it's able to pick up and drop off gas are in the capillaries that line tissue and all of the cells that comprise the tissue. So what ends up happening is the oxygen jumps off of the hemoglobin and at this point enters into the cell. The cell uses it with a sugar molecule. Oxygen and sugar are used by cells to create energy. Cells can't go anywhere, they're stuck where they are. So they rely on battery power to work. That battery pack is known as adenosine triphosphate or ATP. Now you're always trying to charge your battery. And since they can't plug in anywhere, they've got to be able to trickle charge it by having oxygen and sugar. The oxygen and sugar goes into the power plant of the cell known as the mitochondria. And it swirls around, something called the Krebs cycle. And it creates together, the oxygen and the sugar through this, in this mitochondria, create 32 molecules of ATP. So it's a rapid charge of the cell's battery. The waste product of this cellular respiration, this creation of ATP, is carbon dioxide. Carbon dioxide is then kicked out by the cell and goes back into the bloodstream. It now travels up the venules, to the veins, to the great vessel, and now it drops into the right side of the heart, the right atrium, to the right ventricle, and up to the lungs. It goes around the alveoli, and through gas exchange, it switches out with oxygen, and is then exhaled. This is the simple process that's occurring constantly in the human body. Now we breathe 
normally between 10 and 12 times a minute, or once every five to six seconds. We're driven to breathe because the brain can sense high levels of oxygen. I'm sorry, can sense high levels of CO2. The brain monitors the blood and your cerebrospinal fluid and looks for high levels of CO2. When it sees the levels of CO2 reach a certain level, it will trigger a breath. And since we're constantly creating CO2, those levels are reached every five to six seconds. When we exercise, our cells need more oxygen. We have more metabolism and our carbon dioxide levels begin to go up faster. The body responds to this by breathing faster. That's the process. Now the backup system to this is known as the hypoxic drive. You may hear about this, a lot of people who have COPD, who are serious, heavy duty, three pack a day smokers for 30 years, have this problem. And they have to have oxygen at home, and it's very difficult for them to breathe. The reason for this, theoretically, scientists have, have uh, theorized, the reason for this is that all the chemicals that they've inhaled with the cigarettes have thrown off the body's blood and cerebrospinal fluid chemistry so much that the brain can no longer monitor those levels of CO2 to trigger a breath. So what it does instead is it works off of low levels of oxygen. That's known as the hypoxic drive. So the brain, instead of, it can't look for high levels of CO2 because of all of the damage that was done with the smoking. So it goes to the hypoxic drive and it looks for low levels of oxygen and that triggers a breath. So you may hear as EMTs that people with chronic obstructive pulmonary disease or COPD who are on home oxygen should not receive high levels of oxygen because giving them a lot of oxygen will, will make them stop breathing because the hypoxic drive won't work because there aren't low levels of oxygen. Yes, that's it, true in theory, but also it takes 24 hours of this high concentration of oxygen to actually have issues with the hypoxic drive. Not the 10 to 20 minutes that you're going to spend with the patient giving them oxygen. You, they still need it if they're short of breath. They still need a little oxygen to get them breathing again. So if they're short of breath, breathing at a rate over 24, or breathing less than 8, we need to give them high concentration oxygen. Breathing over 24, we're thinking about a non breather. Breathing less than eight, we're thinking about a bag valve mask. But that's the theory of the hypoxic drive. So the, the brain itself controls the breathing, and its drive to breathe is based on high levels of CO2. When it senses those high levels of CO2, it initiates cycles. You have the dorsal respiratory group of nerves called the DRG, initiates inspiration. And then you have the ventral respiratory group, which gives you force inspiration when needed. This is when you're exercising and you have to take deep breaths. You're out of breath. You have more higher demand for oxygen and there's more CO2 being built up in the bloodstream that's got to get out. So when you give high concentration oxygen, you're assisting in ventilation. The act of breathing in and out, the act of inspiration and exhalation, creates volume of air that passes in and out of the lungs. 
This volume of air is known as tidal volume. Just like the tides come in and out, in and out, so do your breathing patterns. The tides of air that flow in on breathing and inspiration and out on exhalation are known as tidal volume. And when we're looking at a patient to see if they're in any respiratory distress, we look for these tidal volumes. And a, and a patient who is breathing normally, doesn't appear to be in any stress, any, any respiratory distress, will have these normal tidal volumes. If you have to ventilate your patient with a bag valve mask, you are mimicking these normal tidal volumes. That's why we just want you to ventilate these patients till you see chest rise. That's it. We're not blowing up a balloon for the Macy's Thanksgiving Day Parade. We are just mimicking the normal body process of normal breathing. Tidal volumes, just to see the chest rise. That's what you want to look for when you're interviewing your patient. Breath sound, the respiratory rate should be regular. And we have good audible breath sounds on both sides of the chest. You're checking for the, not only the patient's right side that has three lobes, but their left side as well. More characteristics of normal breathing, you have the, in addition to the regular rise and fall movement, you'll have some abdominal movement, that's fine. Inadequate breathing, now patients are in distress and they're trying to, to get that same process of ventilation, but they have to use other means to, to normalize, to use it. Well, that's where we have muscle retraction tripod positioning, and then those gasping agonal breaths. The skin gets pale, cyanotic. When you're talking about agonal breaths, we're talking about breathing less than six a minute. When you have somebody who has those six a minute, you have to take over breathing for them. So we're in emergency medicine. We're there to assist patients. We're a service emergency medical service. Services provide assistance when someone can't do something themselves. So if a person's not breathing, we're going to provide the service of breathing for them. Now part of the respiratory system, in order to get cellular respiration, there needs to be that delivery system that I mentioned. The red blood cells with the hemoglobin and the heart pumping down to the tissues and the cells inside. And the way that the red blood cells get from the lungs to the cells in the tissue is, a pro is the system known as the circulatory system. The circulatory system is this complex arrangement of these tubes. From the left ventricle of the heart, you have arteries. Arteries turn into arterioles. Like bronchioles, arterioles can constrict and dilate and regulate blood flow. And the, from the arterioles, we go into the capillaries. Okay, And like the alveoli coming off the bronchioles, these capillaries coming off the arterioles are the functional structures of the cardiovascular system. It is there at the capillaries where gas exchange takes place. Oxygen is delivered and carbon dioxide is picked up. And then we go to the venules, the veins, up to the great vessels, the vena cava, into the right side of the heart, and then we have the journey back to the lungs. So what I described going from the left ventricle to the right atria, that's known as systemic circulation. Arteries, arterioles, capillaries, dropping off oxygen to the cells, picking up cells waste, CO2, going back up the venules, to the veins, to the great vessels, 
the vena cava and into the right atrium of the heart. The pulmonary circulation goes from the right ventricle of the heart to the lungs. This carbon dioxide is then switched over into the alveoli, traded out for the oxygen, and we travel back towards the heart through the pulmonary vein. Now one interesting thing to remember, the circulatory, the systemic circulatory system that delivers oxygen to the cells arteries pump oxygenated blood to the cells. In the pulmonary circulation, arteries pump deoxygenated blood to the heart and veins bring oxygenated blood back to the heart from the lungs. So it's opposite. Here's the graphic. So once again, to review, where are we coming from? From the lungs, we're picking up oxygen and we're dropping off CO2. This pulmonary vein, the only vein that carries oxygenated blood, is bringing it back to the left atria of the heart. The left atria dumps into the left ventricle. The left ventricle then pumps the blood to the aorta and goes down to the tissues, through the arteries, to the arterioles, to the capillaries. There in the capillaries, the tissue, where oxygen travels across into the cells to help the cells produce ATP and charge their battery pack. And then the cells waste carbon dioxide as a process. During the process of charging the battery, they waste carbon dioxide. The carbon dioxide comes back out into the capillaries. Goes up the veins, the vena cava, dumps into the right atria. The right atria of the heart goes into the right ventricle. The right ventricle pumps and goes back to the lungs, where the carbon dioxide is dropped off and the oxygen is picked up. this needs to, to happen with a good pump. The only way you're going to have any of this functionality is if you have a good pump. And that pump of the circulatory system is the heart. The heart is a hollow organ. It has four chambers, two on the right and two on the left. The top portion are known as the atria and the bottom portion are known as the ventricle. So you have a right atria, right ventricle, left atria, left ventricle about the size of a clenched fist. Each side has that upper and lower chamber. Atrias are upper, ventricles are lower. So the heart is getting its blood from those, that pulmonary vein and the vena cava. The superior vena cava takes that deoxygenated blood that's high in carbon dioxide, coming back from the cells, dumps it into the right atria. The right atria pumps it to the lungs. The lungs exchange the gas. Carbon dioxide is exhaled, oxygen is inhaled. And off we go, back to the heart, to the left atria, down to the left ventricle where this newly oxygenated blood is pumped out and sent to all the cells. Now on average the heart will pump between 60 and 100 times or beats a minute. 
the amount of blood that is pumped out of the left ventricle with each beat is known as the stroke volume. So you can call a heartbeat, it's a pump and it's a stroke. It's pushing that blood out. And cardiac output is the amount of blood that is pumped out in a minute. So your heart rate times your stroke volume equals your cardiac output. So if your heart rate is 80 and the blood that's being pumped out is 70 milliliters, you will have a cardiac output of 5,600 milliliters per minute. Now our circulating blood, the amount of blood we have in our body, is about 5,600 milliliters. So what that means is that it takes the journey of a red blood cell, one red blood cell, will journey from the lungs, make the seeding the oxygen molecules on the hemoglobin, travel down to the cell, drop off the oxygen, and come back up to the lungs in one minute. In other words, the time I took to describe the process, it was done. In order for this to happen effectively and constantly, you need to have the pump working in peak form. There is a conduction network that allows the heart to pump in unison. This electrical system allows for smooth, coordinated contractions, both of the atrias and the ventricles. Because these contractions are what allow for the pumping action to occur. So coming off of the heart or off of the lungs, I'm sorry, coming off of the heart are the arteries. And those arteries will branch into the arterioles which have the smooth muscle that allow for constriction or dilation and will increase or decrease pressure. Every time the heart pumps, you feel a wave on an artery. Arteries that are closest to the skin will generate a pulse that you can feel. The major arteries we have, the aortic artery, the, the pulmonary, which comes off of the right ventricle and goes to the lungs, the carotids in your neck, the femoral in your thigh, your femur, the posterior tibial, which is found in your lower leg, your, fib your fibula, and the foot, the dorsalis pedis. These are the, the points where you can actually feel a pulse are the carotids, the femoral, the posterior tibial, and the dorsalis pedis. The aorta and the pulmonary arteries are, are protected inside the rib cage, and you can't feel them. Two other arteries that you're able to feel that come really close to the, the skin, the brachial in the upper arm and the radial in the wrist. Now the radial artery is on the side where you have your thumb. The, that part is where you have your radial artery. And you can see that on the picture. So those are the major arteries and this network, these these are the highways that branch off into the arterioles and then the capillaries. And once again, these capillaries coming off of the arterioles, this is the functional area of the, of the circulatory system. This is where the, not only the gas exchange takes place, where oxygen gets dumped off into the cells and CO2 gets picked up, but also nutrients are, are supplied sugar, proteins, anything that, that you digest in your body that's now in the bloodstream, this is where it gets delivered to the cells, at the capillaries. And it's such an intricate network, there are billions of capillaries. So 
since one red blood cell can fit through a capillary bed at a time, it is so intricate and it, it's like a netting around your tissue that allows for this blood and the, the products inside the blood to perfuse into the cells. This is known as perfusion. This is where it takes place. From there, we're coming back to the heart, and we do that with the veins. There's no pumping, it's just pushing that brings this blood back to the heart. So veins don't have pulses. Now, inside the blood can be products that we need for life, that, are, that provide um, healthy function for the cells, but also there can be some bad components, waste, and things that you've, you've taken in that are harmful to the body, or bacteria, viruses, diseases of all different types. So we need to have a filtration system. And we have that with the spleen. The spleen is the largest, it's kind of like the sewage treatment plant of the body. It will filter out all of the waste products so it doesn't pass to the cells and cause diseases. But because this is a solid organ that filters blood, it's full of blood. In fact, about 20% of your circulating blood volume is in the spleen at every time. So let's talk about that. What is that? That's let, about a liter of blood is in your spleen at all times, being filtered and processed. So if someone gets damaged to the spleen, it can lead to major internal bleeding. So those are the connectors. You have the pump and you have the pipes. Now you need to have fluid. That's the third portion of the circulatory system. The fluid is known as blood. Blood, by definition, is connective tissue. It is tissue, but it's loose tissue. It's groups of cells grouped together, but it's in a loose way. It's in a liquid form. The cells that we're talking about are the red cells, the white cells, okay? And then the other formed elements, like plasma, I'm sorry, like um, platelets, proteins, these are elements of blood. Plasma itself is the fluid that gives the blood its ability to be liquid. In order to have the ability to get that red blood cell from the lungs to the tissue and back to the lungs in a minute, you got to have pressure. There's got to be good pressure. And, and any plumber will tell you, you got to have constant pressure in order to have this work. You can't lose pressure. There needs to be that pulse pressure with each time the, the pump works. And there has to be resting pressure every time the pump is relaxed in order to keep it. Or else everything would collapse every time the heart stopped its beat in between beats. So having that that pulse pressure and that resting pressure, that's known as blood pressure. The pulse pressure is known as systolic pressure. The resting pressure is known as diastolic pressure. So when we take a blood pressure, what we're listening for are the pressures against the walls of the arteries. When the heart pumps, that's known as systolic but also the pressure exerted against the walls of the artery when the heart's not pumping. That's the low point. So people who have hypertension, doctors are more concerned about the resting pressure. So hypertension is defined as any diastolic pressure, any diastolic pressure above 90 millimeters of mercury because that puts stress on the system when it's not working. 
it needs to have a little downtime in between each beat. Even if the beats are coming once a second, that period of time in between the seconds, they need to rest. And if they don't rest, if the pressure is too high, it can lead to weakening of the walls, ruptures, bleeds, things like that. So in order to maintain this balance of pressures, keeping the constant pressures allow this movement of red blood cells to deliver the oxygen, the nutrients be delivered to cells, so the cells can be alive. We need to have normal circulation. And this normal circulation, we don't like using the term normal in medicine, it's all about what's regular for that patient. What's regular for you might not be regular for other people, but you've got to maintain balance. Now this balance is known as homeostasis. Okay, and in the bloodstream, in the circulatory system, we call this hemostasis, normal circulation, getting that oxygen and those nutrients to the cells is known as perfusion. And like I've been saying, the goal of perfusion is to have enough pressure so that the intricate capillaries receive blood supply. If you don't have good blood pressure, you won't be able to get blood to the capillaries. And as a result, the cells will be deprived of oxygen. They'll not be able to have respiration. They won't be able to charge their battery pack, create ATP, and they will begin to die. This is known as inadequate circulation or hypoperfusion. And different things can cause hypoperfusion. Another term that we use that describes hypoperfusion is shock. So blood, in addition to transporting and delivering life requiring products like sugar, like water, like oxygen, like proteins, like electrolytes, in addition to that, blood fights infection, white blood cells. Blood controls your pH balance, normal pH in humans is 7.35 to 7.45. The pH measures the amount of hydrogen in a product, in a substance. The higher the hydrogen, the lower the pH number. And the more acidic the liquid is. So, if we're 7, and that's water, 7 is water, Zero is acid, 14 is alkaline. As you go higher up and you lose hydrogen, the pH, gets, the pH number gets bigger and you're more alkalytic. You have to maintain that pH between 7.35 and 7.45. And the blood will do that by getting rid of CO2. CO2 can bring on excess acid. It makes the blood acidic. So having all this excess CO2 will drop your pH. You don't want that. Having too little CO2 gets rid of this excess, this hydrogen, and makes you more alkalytic, which you don't want as well. You've got to have that balance. That's 7.35 to 7.45. What's also in the blood is the the um, ability to repair the vessels. This is where platelets come in. This is where the proteins of clotting or coagulation come in. 
And if you have a rupture of your circulatory system, these platelets, along with their clotting mechanisms and the proteins that make these clots, literally create spackle that closes the hole until it can be repaired, prevents further blood loss. Now the smooth muscle of the bronchioles and the arterioles are, like I said before, involuntary muscle. They're not controlled by the conscious thought. You can't regulate your bronchioles or your arterioles consciously, but they are under control of the nervous system. This is known as the autonomic nervous system. This is the diagnostic center at the base of your brain that, listen, does all of the scut work. The dot, they basically make sure that you are in balance so you can worry about other things. Like, I don't know, who you're starting on your fantasy football team this week. You don't worry about what your blood pressure or heart rate is to achieve homeostasis. That's up to your diagnostic center, the involuntary muscles that it controls. So the autonomic nervous system is regulated by two settings, the sympathetic or the parasympathetic. Sympathetic is also known as the fight or flight syndrome. The fight or flight response, it's a stress response. And the body, the nervous system, uses a hormone as a neurotransmitter that sends the signal to all of the organs that are part of the fight or flight response. And the neurotransmitter that it uses is norepinephrine. Norepinephrine and epinephrine have effects on the smooth muscle of the bronchioles and the arterioles. They also have an effect on cardiac cells. And the way they do that is that they lock on to receptor sites that are located on the cell membrane, the outside of the cell. It's constantly monitoring the bloodstream. And these hormones lock on and they activate the creation of a protein. The protein gives a command to the cell to do a function. This is where people have a hard time understanding how it actually works. Let me just explain to you that cells are able to communicate with each other. Just like we have speech, we have language, so too do cells. And the brain communicates with cells. That's this way. And the language of cells are proteins. Proteins are, are basically strings of amino acids. Amino acids are words, then proteins are sentences and commands. Now, some proteins are very small strands of amino acids. Some proteins are, are millions of amino acids together. But it doesn't matter, just like commands. Some are very simple commands, some are very intricate commands. That's how the brain communicates with the cells, is the creation of these proteins. And it all starts with hormones. Hormones are kind of like the email that the brain send out to this target cells. Just like when you send an email to a friend, a colleague, you, you have a request or a command, or if you're a supervisor of a group and you want to send a group email out to your team and tell them to, I don't know, put cover sheets on their TPS reports from now on, okay? You send it out as a group email, they all receive it. But when you're sending out that email, 
Are you sending it to your targeted group? You send it out to everybody in the World Wide Web. Well, that's what happens with the secretion of epinephrine and norepinephrine. It's sent out throughout this whole circulatory system. But it's only picked up by these targeted receptor sites, just like the emails that you send are only picked up by the targeted email accounts that are constantly monitoring the World Wide Web and downloading any emails addressed to them. So the norepinephrine and the epinephrine get secreted by the adrenal glands. And the norepinephrine and the epi, they get sent out into the bloodstream. They're picked up by the receptor sites of these targeted cells. And in order to, to do this, the targeted cells are constantly monitoring the circulatory system. So you have what scientists have determined to be beta and alpha receptors. And epinephrine and norepinephrine are agonists of these receptors, meaning that they lock on to the receptors. So epinephrine, and they'll send separate commands. It's not one command. This is what's interesting. When epinephrine is grabbed by beta receptors, we have beta-1 receptors on the heart, and we have beta-2 receptors on the lungs. I remember this because we have one heart and two lungs. So beta-1 receptors on the heart, on the cardiac cells, pick up epinephrine, triggers the creation of a protein that tells the cardiac cell to be stronger, harder, faster. Okay? Beta-2 receptors, located on the bronchioles in the lungs, when they pick up epinephrine, a protein is created that instructs the cell to relax. Different command than what it would tell the cardiac cell. It tells the smooth muscles in the bronchioles to relax. And the reason for that is we need to increase our diameter to get more air in since we're in a fight or flight response. Just like our heart rate needs to increase because we're under stress, fight or flight response. We're increasing our systolic pressure. Now alpha receptors are also triggered by epinephrine and you find alpha receptors on the, the membranes of, the cell membrane of the smooth muscle of the arterioles. And the arterioles, when they receive epinephrine, a protein is created commanding them not to relax, but to constrict. So what's fascinating about hormones, the way that the brain can communicate, it can send basically an email packet and give separate commands to each cell group. But that's how it communicates with its body. So what we end up doing with this, what we call an adrenergic response from a cardiorespiratory viewpoint, we're going to see an increase in heart rate, we're going to see an increase in systolic blood pressure, we're going to see by arterials constricting an increase in peripheral vascular resistance, which will lead to increased diastolic pressure, and our lungs will, bronchioles will dilate, which will allow us to breathe faster and more effectively. So that's your fight or flight. That's when you have to problem solve. Your body is able to do it very quickly. It's good for dealing with sudden blood loss, dealing with problems, you're, you get better oxygenation to your brain, you can make better decisions. It is a great function of the human body. When you're not in sympathetic tone, the other tone that you're in is parasympathetic. This is the default setting of the human body. This is also known as the feed or breed. This is where you relax, digest, watch TV, things that we can do for days. 
if we were able to, we could be parasympathetic for a very long time. It's a relaxation. This is where the body is able to digest. It, it, lowers the, it, it lowers the stress response. So it's a relaxation mode. It's good for, for maintaining good, healthy balance. It's the parasympathetic nervous system. Its effects on the cardiovascular system will lower your heart rate. Your blood pressure, as a result, will go down. You're relaxing on the couch, eating potato chips, watching TV. You're digesting. You're taking it easy. This is not part of your fight or flight response. So that's the autonomic nervous system. It's fast. Norepinephrine and epinephrine control your sympathetic, the neurotransmitter that controls your parasympathetic is, is something known as acetylcholine. So the brain can control the function of the organs through these basic processes, sympathetic and parasympathetic. The brain and the central nervous system is the brain and the spinal cord. From the brain and spinal cord, the central nervous system innervates the peripheral nervous system. It starts with the 12 cranial nerves and it moves from there. And it goes all the way down to your fingers and toes. It deals with your sensory function, your motor function. It deals with um, all of your organs, how they operate, everything is your peripheral nervous system. And here's the breakdown. So you've got at the top in blue, the central nervous system, which is your brain and your spinal cord. I'm going to say that again because it's important. The central nervous system is comprised of the brain and the spinal cord. From there is the peripheral nervous system. And there are two divisions. You have a downtown track and an uptown track. The motor division and the sensory division. The motor division is controlled by the brain and it breaks down into the autonomic nervous system and the somatic nervous system. We just described the autonomic nervous system which is split into the sympathetic and parasympathetic, the fight or flight, feed or breed. The other part of the motor system is the somatic nervous system. And the somatic nervous system is controlling the skeletal muscles, all your voluntary muscles, your musculoskeletal system. So that's part of your motor vision. That's what's coming down from the brain and spinal cord, the CNS, for control. But we also need to be aware of our surroundings. And we receive stimuli that we send up to the brain, and that's the uptown track known as the sensory division. It's going to control all this sensory information and interpret it from the reflex arc in the spinal cord all the way up to the top of the brain, to the cerebrum, where it interprets the pain stimulus or things like heat, cold, light, all this stuff is part of sensory. Light, smell, taste, touch, all that is part of sensory. And then the, the brain interprets it and sends out a motor response. From the motor response, it's either autonomic or somatic. It's either involuntary or voluntary. And if it's involuntary, it's fight or flight or feed or breed. So this is the structure of the brain. The cerebrum is, is the, the intelligent aspect of the brain. The cerebellum controls balance, and the brain stem controls is your diagnostic center that handles your day-to-day -day operations. The cerebrum is the CEO. The CEO should just be handling issues as they come in and not worry about the day-to-day -day stuff. The day-to-day -day stuff is handled by the operation center, which is the brainstem and the cerebellum. Coming off of the brainstem is the spinal cord. It's a continuation of the brain. 
and it's protected by the vertebral column, seven cervical, 12 thoracic, five lumbar, five sacrum, four coccyx. Coming off about, it, it goes about till lumbar two or L2, and then it innervates out and becomes part of the peripheral nervous system. So that's it under graphic form. And what you're looking at here, coming off, innervating off of L2, L3, is a network of nerves known as the cauda equina, that's Greek for a horse's tail. And it is, those resemble a, a tail, a horse's tail of nerves. One of the major nerves that comes off of it goes down to your legs known as the sciatic nerve. That's part of the peripheral nervous system. So the somatic nervous system allows for those voluntary muscles to move, and it's under conscious control. The autonomic, we have the involuntary actions, either the sympathetic fight or flight, or the parasympathetic, the feed or breathe, slowing down body systems. And in the peripheral nervous system, we have the downtown track, the motor, and the uptown track, the sensory. So when we're doing a neurologic exam, we got to check for both the downtown function and the uptown. We got to check for, in addition to pulse, we got to check for motor and sensory function as well. Because you can lose one and still have the other. Now, I mentioned earlier, the largest organ in the body is the skin. It's actually a body system. It's known as the integumentary system. It's comprised, the skin is comprised of of two major layers. You have the epidermis, which is the superficial layer. It's what is visible. And the dermal layer, which is more of the functional area of the skin. So the epidermal layer is the protective shield, the protective casing that's actually waterproof. And the dermal layer is where all of the skin's functions take place. Below the skin is the anchoring device that allows it to anchor to the muscles so it doesn't fall off. That's known as the subcutaneous layer. And from there, it attaches to connective tissue called fascia, F-A-S-C-I-A. So what am I looking at here? Okay, so from the top, the epidermis, that's your, comprised mostly of dead cells, that is like a shield, it's a watertight shield shell protection from the outside. Then we have our, at the base, is where these cells are created. And you see these ridges? This is what gives you contours in your skin and your things like your fingerprints. What resides below the epidermis is the dermal layer. And the dermis is where all of your, your functional areas are. You have your hair follicles, you have your sweat glands, nerve endings, okay, sebaceous glands that secrete oils that keep the skin um, from going too dry. It keeps them nice, moist, and lubricated. Below that is the subcutaneous layer. This is where excess sugar is kept, kind of as storage for when you weren't able to eat. Remember, the body is estimated to be 10,000 years old. This, this is an old design, and a long time ago, you didn't know where your next meal was coming from. I mean, now we, we have to determine whether we want to do a walk-in or a drive-through for getting food. So it's kind of different, but it doesn't matter. The body still, if it, you, if it takes in more sugar than it needs, it will store the excess sugar as fat. And this is where it stores it, right? In the skin, separating between the base of the dermal layer and the connective tissue that anchors it to the muscle known as the fascia. So in addition to protecting the body from the environment, that epidermal layer does, it also works in regulating body temperature. If it's too hot, it will begin to sweat to cool the body down. It also transmits environmental information to the brain, and the brain reacts. Talking about the digestive system, how we get our nutrients. We already discussed how oxygen is entered. 
But how do we get everything else? We get it through the digestive process. And the digestive system is a network of organs that's located in the abdominal cavity. And we break down the quadrants. Like I said, you have the right and left upper quadrants and the right and left lower quadrants. This is, the, this is how it's shaped up. And you can see in the upper quadrants we have the functional organs, the liver, the spleen, the gallbladder, and the stomach, all located in the right and left upper quadrants. Right and lower, lower, right and left lower quadrants are primarily your small intestines in the center and the large intestines on the outside. One thing you find in the right lower quadrant is your appendix. Getting food down into the stomach has the structures that are very similar to breathing. You have your oropharynx, your mouth, your jaw, start the process of chewing and digestion through that chewing process known as mastication. And it involves the jaw moving back and forth and saliva being bathed on whatever you're, whatever you're eating. And then the food passes through and is swallowed into the esophagus, down into the stomach. Where the process of breaking down this complex food into its simplest form, usable for the body, takes place. And it does it through digestion. Digestion starts with acids in the stomach. And the pH of these stomach acids can be one or sometimes even a pH of zero. It's really, really acidic. And it destroys a lot of microorganisms right there, so it prevents infection. And it moves on to the pancreas. The pancreas has what are called digestive enzymes. The thing about enzymes is that they are able to change the shape and break down products without affecting change on their end. So these digestive enzymes are very powerful and dangerous if let out into the loose into the rest of the body. So the pancreas creates these digestive enzymes and they get dumped into the small intestine and aid in the digestion. And they break down fats and complex sugars. The liver secretes something called bile. Bile also helps to break down. It's very alkalytic. It breaks down um, the fats that the, the stomach, the acid in the stomach wasn't able to break down. From there we go into the small intestine. In the small intestine is where the reabsorption, you absorb all of those nutrients. That's where it takes place. As the food moves through the small intestine, there's a network of capillaries that draw up the nutrients. Proteins, sugar, fats, things that are necessary for human function are now drawn into the vasculature and they're heading to the liver. The liver is going to filter the blood of any excess stuff that got, got, got trapped in, the, that got absorbed in that the body doesn't need. And then send out this nutrient rich blood into circulation. Whatever's left behind that didn't get absorbed goes into the large intestine and is then travels through the large intestine to the rectum and is excreted as fecal waste. So you have the acid from the stomach, you have the, the alkalis from the liver, but you've got the enzymes from the pancreas. And all of these are breaking down complex food items that have been introduced or, or swallowed into the body. They break them down so the cells can use them. Now I touched on the endocrine system when I was describing the sympathetic response and the use of norepinephrine and epinephrine. These are hormones that 
that are secreted by the adrenal gland. But there are other glands that are out there. There are other email packets that can be sent out by the brain. And this is the system that's used is known as the endocrine system. In addition to the epinephrine and norepinephrine, another major hormone that's used daily is insulin. Insulin is secreted by the beta glands of the beta cells of the pancreas. And insulin sends a message to the cells to let sugar in. See, a sugar molecule is really a big, fat, gloppy molecule that even from a carbohydrate it's broken down to a sugar, that's the simplest form, it still is pretty much unusable. It needs help getting across into the cell membrane. And without insulin to, to assist it, through to give the message like yeah you can let this guy through it won't make it into the cell even though the cell needs to use it to create ATP it's still too big so without insulin you can't have sugar make it into the cell and that's why diabetics who don't produce insulin end up having a lot of blood their blood sugar levels go very very high because the the sugar can't get into the cells In addition to the adrenal glands on the kidneys and the, that secrete epinephrine and norepinephrine and the beta cells in the pancreas that secrete insulin, we have a network, we have other glands. Starting off with the pituitary gland, that's known as the master gland. That's controlled by the brain directly. The pituitary gland can actually send out hormones that tell the other glands to do things. And these glands, that they secrete the hormones that tell the body to do different functions. The urinary system. The urinary system is controlling the fluid balance in the body. In addition to getting rid of excess waste, creation of urine, the waste products of normal cellular metabolism, acids from normal cell work and the off product of muscle use okay is also gathered and sent and created as urine it also controls your blood pressure so if you have too much fluid you'll increase your urine production and this helps in maintaining your pH balance of 7.35 to 7.45 So the functional part of the urinary system are the nephrons that are in the kidneys. So the kidneys are that, that organ that gives it a structure. You have a right and a left kidney. They sit retroperitoneal. They sit behind the peritoneal sac that actually encases the, the digestive organs. They sit behind that up against the back. The, the uh, right kidney is a little bit lower than the left kidney and it's fed by blood coming off the renal artery. So the renal arteries go into the kidneys and the blood is filtered through that and then the renal veins come out with the newly cleansed blood and return it to circulation. The urine that's created by these kidneys drains through the ureters into the bladder and is then excreted out as urine. A weapon, the, the um, organs of reproduction. For the male system, consists of the testicles, the epidemius, the vasa differentia, and the penis. And the, the uh, creation of sperm and the delivery of sperm to create life is the function of this system. So you can see the testes, 
secrete the semen, the epididymis set secrete in and up into the vasa differentia and out as sperm. The female system is comprised of, instead of, instead of testes, they have ovaries. These ovaries create eggs. And it's on a lunar cycle. Every 28 days, an egg is created, pops out of the ovary, drops into the fallopian tubes, and at the fallopian tubes, it travels to the uterus. During this period of time, when it's traveling through the fallopian tubes, is where the women have the highest probability of conception. This is known as ovulation. It's traveling through the fallopian tubes and going into the uterus. If the body senses that it's, a, it's now a newly fertilized egg, a zygote, it will allow it to implant on the wall of the uterus and we would start the process of pregnancy. If it detects that it is in fact not a zygote, it was not fertilized, then it is excreted out through a menstruation, through the cervix and out the vagina. So once again, the ovary creates the ovum, the egg, that travels through the fallopian tubes, and in this period of time, it's about a three to five day journey. This is the time when women are at highest risk for conception. Conception will take place right in the fallopian tube, and the newly fertilized egg will come out and enter, lock onto the uterus. If the body senses that it's not fertilized, then the blood that was in the uterus wall that was preparing for implantation by the egg, it gets sloughed off and excreted out through down the vaginal canal, and that is known as menstruation. This happens in a 28-day cycle. And when it continues, it starts when um, first period is when you end up having your hormonal changes of puberty about the age of 12, and it goes until the woman runs out of eggs. There's only a finite amount of eggs in each ovary. And the ovaries, they trigger one month does one, the other one does on the other one. So the ovaries go on a two month cycle, and they, inter they interact with each other. So it goes until they run out of eggs, and they run out of eggs, this is known as menopause. So all of these body systems are doing independent functions, but they all work separately, but together to keep the organism alive. Some work in conjunction with others. They're all pretty much governed by the nervous system. But the takeaway from this is understanding that the functional unit of life is the cell. And the cell requires a constant supply of sugar, water, and oxygen to charge its battery pack known as adenosine triphosphate. The way it receives these nutrients, these vital gases, is through the circulatory system. The circulatory system has to be under correct and constant pressure in order for this to work. If there's a problem with the delivery, then cells begin to suffocate and die. Understand adenosine triphosphate. As EMTs, we can control this, we can regulate it, we can improve it, we can assist it. But without adenosine triphosphate, we can't survive. The use of oxygen and sugar together in that Krebs cycle to produce those 32 molecules of ATP, that's known as aerobic metabolism. A waste product of aerobic metabolism is carbon dioxide. 
without, without oxygen, the body can still work that Krebs cycle. They can use sugar only and burn it without oxygen. The problem is they only make two molecules of ATP, not 32 like they would with oxygen, only two. And the waste product that they secrete is not carbon dioxide, it's lactic acid. And this lactic acid makes the body extremely acidic and can cause death to other tissues that are healthy and receiving oxygen. So the two molecules of ATP are not enough for most cells to survive. After a while, they'll end up running out of power to function and they'll die. The process of just burning sugar without oxygen is known as anaerobic metabolism and the waste product that's created is lactic acid. The human body needs to keep these structures functioning in a balance known as homeostasis so that these products can be delivered to the cells to keep them alive. We're trillions of cells that are operating on battery power. That's what we are. We don't plug in we keep our battery pack running with fuel, the food we eat and the air we breathe. But we've got to get it delivered. Without effective delivery system, it doesn't matter. We won't be able to survive. So the study of pathophysiology is the understanding of anatomy and physiology and knowing that there is either injury or damage to a system and how we can go about repairing it. In emergency medicine, it's all about maintaining a good airway, assuring good oxygenation, and good circulation. That's known as the A's, B's, and C's, right? Airway, breathing, circulation. We need that sugar, water, oxygen to survive. Well, we're about 60% water, right? That's 60% of our body weight is water. Sugar can be stored as fat. So we'll probably never have an issue with that. But oxygen, you only have a four minute supply of oxygen. So if you can get the oxygen into the patient, you give the patient the best chance at survivability because you'll be able to keep the cells alive. And if you have a good airway and you provide oxygen into the airway and you circulate that effectively so it reaches, most importantly, the brain in the emergency setting, and that's all you need to worry about because you have an understanding of the human body. So, this understanding of human anatomy and physiology makes you better able to assess and manage your patients. Knowing your superficial landmarks is important because you know what lies beneath. Remember, bones, ligaments, tendons, and cartilage give the body its human form and shape. The skeletal system provides protection, allows for movement, gives it its overall shape. Musculoskeletal system works in conjunction with the skeletal system to allow for movement. It's under conscious control. The respiratory system is designed, its function is to create a passage for air to make it into the circulatory system. The, the respiration is the introduction of oxygen to the cell and the, and the picking up of the carbon dioxide waste that was done by the cell as a byproduct of aerobic metabolism. The circulatory system is complex. Remember that arteries, arterioles carry oxygenated blood. Venules and veins carry deoxygenated blood. 
for the systemic circulation. Pulmonary circulation, arteries carry deoxygenated blood to the lungs and veins carry oxygenated blood back to the heart. The functional area where gas exchange takes place, both in the lungs and in the tissue, is at the arterioles. It's all governed by the nervous system, either consciously through the somatic or unconsciously through the autonomic. The autonomic nervous system is fight or flight, sympathetic, or feed or breed, parasympathetic. Know about the skin. The skin is the protective agent covering, it senses environmental changes through its functional area. It's held on to the, to the muscles, muscles by fascia. It's the largest single organ in the body. The digestive system comprised of the stomach and intestines, but also the mouth, salivary glands, the esophagus all allow for the introduction of food in, but it's all about drawing out the nutrients from this product that was just digested, was just eaten, swallowed, and then the waste product left over is excreted as fecal matter. The way the brain communicates with its organs and its organ systems is through email packets that are sent out by the endocrine system. These email packets are known as hormones. The major hormones that you need to know. Epinephrine and norepinephrine by the adrenal glands, those are the neurotransmitters of the sympathetic nervous system. Acetylcholine is, is the neurotransmitter of the parasympathetic and somatic nervous system. No insulin as the, as the uh, hormone that allows for sugar to enter the cell. Without insulin, sugar can't enter the cell, and we have a disease known as diabetes. The urinary system, controls your blood pressure by regulating the amount of fluid in your body. It also gets rid of excess waste from cellular metabolism, ureic acid, and the like. Your reproductive systems are governed by hormonal response. Males stimulate the production of sperm. Women have a 28-day cycle that prepares them for pregnancy. And when that pregnancy occurs, the body is prepared to do it by keeping levels of estrogen and progesterone imbalance, and if there's no pregnancy detected, then we have menstruation. So, just a quick review, a couple questions. What lies in the retroperitoneal space? You know, it's C, the kidneys. The kidneys lie in the space behind the abdominal cavity. Okay, the spleen, liver, and stomach are part of what we call the true abdomen. Number two, the cartilaginous tip of the sternum is known as what? The costal arch, the manubrium, the angle of Louis, or the xiphoid process? It's the xiphoid process. The xiphoid process looks like a little Indian arrowhead that sits at the base of the sternum. And if you, you compress it, if you do chest compression a little too low on CPR, you can pop this little Indian arrowhead off and it'll go into the liver and we don't want to have that happen. So, Always make sure hand placement is centered towards the top of the, of the sternum. A person with bilateral femur fractures has what? The answer is B. It refers to both sides, bilateral, both sides. If it's one side, it's known as unilateral. The most prominent landmark on the anterior surface of the neck is what? The most prominent landmark. The answer is C. It's the Adam's apple in men, the thyroid cartilage in women. The most prominent landmark that you can see, especially in men. Insulin is produced in the... The answer is B, the pancreas. The pancreas, in addition to producing insulin and beta cells, also produces those digestive enzymes that it dumps into the small intestine that aids in, in the breakdown of nutrients. The medial aspect of a bone is that part of a bone that lies where? The answer is C. The term medial means towards the midline. Lateral means away. Okay, so the part that's nearer to the back is said to be posterior, whereas closer to the front is inferior. 
The normal resting adult heart rate is? The answer is B, 60 to 100. If you drop below 60, it's called bradycardia, or slow heartbeat. If you go above 100, that's known as tachycardia, or fast heartbeat. The left atrium of the blood receives what kind of blood? From the where? The answer is A. The left atrium receives oxygenated blood from the lungs through the pulmonary veins. Remember, the pulmonary veins are the only veins that carry oxygenated blood. The largest part of the brain is known as the, it's the cerebrum. That's where your, you reside. That's where your database of memories is. That's where your higher levels of thinking is located. The cerebellum and the midbrain, the brainstem, that's the diagnostic center that allows, maintains homeostasis. Which of the following statements about red blood cells is false? The answer is C. Hemoglobin molecules in red blood cells contain iron, which give blood its red color. It also carries oxygen. White blood cells, however, play a role in infection control. 